One of my favorite singers, uh, not only was with the Statesmen, but also with the Imperials, um, was Gary McSpadden. And uh, Gary McSpadden was a preacher's son from Texas and sang, of course, with the Bill Gaither Trio, was his most notable uh, spot there in gospel music. And uh, just a wonderful man of God, but he felt the, the earnest desire, the tug on his heart to get back to, uh, <laughs> thank you, no, good, that uh, the earnest desire to get back to pastoral ministry. So he started a church in Branson, Missouri, and had great success. I want to give credit to Gary McSpadden today because as far as I know, he is uh, the first one to come up with the title of today's message, and that is a Jezebel spirit. And I know there are other famous preachers that have capitalized on that title and that sermon of late, uh, but Gary, as far as I know, had it first. Maybe he got it from his daddy, I don't know. But nonetheless, a Jezebel spirit. We should not be shocked by the developments of these last days. Everything that you and I are seeing today is recorded in the Word of God. We've been warned in the Old Testament and in the New Testament by the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, these are the signs of the times. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Hallelujah. And so don't be worried, and don't be sad, and don't be gloomy, but rejoice. Jesus is coming again, and when he comes, he'll straighten the whole mess out just by his appearance. The signs of the times are clear in the Word of God. One of the most uh, infamous um, statements that you have heard in the past week has been noted by many a pe person on TV and radio, we're queer, we're here, and we're coming after your kids. It tells you the vile, wicked state that America is in right now. Within four miles of this church, be it north, south, east, or west, I can take you to churches that believe it's all okay with God. And here I am in the middle of all four of them saying, it's not okay. Nor is any other sin. Let's not just pick on one now. Let's, let's get real about this thing. And all sin is a reproach to God. But uh, it seems like we have two that are just coming to the forefront more and more and more. The sin, I said the sin of homosexuality. The amazing number of violent acts in our nation. Murders, shootings. We can't go two days without a shooting in this country. Such a nation of violence. I could also preach about the spirit of Molech. Those who sacrifice their children to their God. And what are we doing by the 60 millions? We're killing our babies. And so I find America today a blessed nation. God has blessed this land. Everybody wants to come here because the blessing of God has rested upon this land. And yet we find such terrible things that are entering into our culture and to our lives. And so we must preach both. The blessing of God. How many of you are thankful for the blessing of God? Yeah. And also the judgment of God. I don't hear many preachers on television or in churches around us that are preaching the judgment of God, yet the Bible is half of that. And so we want to focus a little bit on this. But what I want you to do today is think about not being worried or overwhelmed, concerned by the wickedness that abounds. There's always been wickedness. But just know that God has everything under control. Amen. Nothing takes God by surprise. And all of these things have been foretold in the Scripture. The signs of the times are clear in the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen. So we speak today on the subject of a Jezebel spirit. I mentioned that uh, uh, Gary McSpadden had the title for that, and I heard his series on a Jezebel spirit, and it's well worth watching on YouTube. Uh, Gary is no longer with us. He died of COVID during the COVID years. But... Uh, it's worth your time. I stole his title, but not his sermon. So here we go. 
Number one, a Jezebel spirit is represented by her idolatry, first and foremost, her idolatry. We look in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 through 33, and we find Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Catch this, above all that were before him, 1 Kings 16, 30. He did more evil than all that were before him. Now you have to remember there's a divided nation, ten tribes Israel, two tribes Judah. The ten tribes, the kings of, of Israel, starting with Jeroboam on down, there was not one good king, not one righteous king in the ten tribes from the division of the kingdom of Israel. Not one. Judah, some good ones, but not, not many. But not one good king proceeds out of Israel. Such was the division of Jeroboam and the resulting kings that follow. And of course, Israel, the ten tribes, are the first to go into captivity before Judah ever went into captivity. And so we find here he is even worse than all these bad kings in Israel. You really have to work at it to be worse than all the other kings in the ten tribes of Israel. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel. If uh, you're having children or grandchildren, I suggest that you never name your granddaughter or daughter Jezebel. Not a good choice. He took to wife Jezebel. I want you to notice the last three letters of that word, Bel, Jezebel, who reflects upon the worship of her foreign gods, plural gods, Baal, Baal, if you will. Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, which of course represents Baal or Baal, as you would pronounce it. Eth Baal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal. Ahab did this. He married Jezebel. She is a Phoenician. And then he goes and serves Baal and worshiped him. How foolish it is to worship any god except the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, boy, I thought you'd shout me down there. It is a foolish thing to worship any other god, gods, than this God, the one true living God. Hero Israel, the Lord our Lord is one Lord, one God. Amen. He only is to be worshipped and served. And here is Ahab because of the influence. Be careful who you marry, kids. Because of the influence of his wife. He is given more readily to the decline spiritually rather than what would happen if he would marry a righteous woman. Now this has absolutely nothing to do with race. Nothing to do with race. Consider Joseph, consider Moses, and we could go on through the scripture and talk about different ones that married outside of their race. This is a spiritual, not a racial matter. Let me say it again. This is a spiritual, not a racial matter matter. He marries this Jezebel and her influence is so great that this, I'm going to call him what he is, the wimpy king Ahab follows after her gods rather than the one true God that he should follow after. He then goes up and raises an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Yet another problem, worshiping in Samaria, not Jerusalem. And raising up this temple for Baal. He not only does that in verse 33, he made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. How many know it's an unwise thing to provoke the God of Israel? Well, the five of you agree with me. <laughs> He did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger. Did you know that God gets angry? Man. 
He provoked God to anger more than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Her idolatry continues in 1 Kings chapter 18. Now chapter 18 you'll well know is when the fire came from heaven and consumed the sacrifice on the altar. The prophets of Baal are killed. The, the other uh, uh, false prophets are, are killed along with them. 850 in total. But nonetheless before that happens in 1 Kings 18, 17 through 19. Here is the confrontation of, of Elijah and Ahab. And so Ahab puts on his manly shoes and says to Elijah are you the one troubling Israel? You know, there are a lot of people in America today think that we're the problem. They think we're troubling the nation. We're not accepting. We're not uh, inclusive. Mm. Are you the one troubling Israel? He, I wonder how long he had to think about that one, or, or did his staff come up with it? Are you the one troubling Israel? If I could paraphrase it, I know Elijah's response. Not me, man. You. You're the one troubling Israel. He answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast fallen Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel to Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, how many of you can do math? Here we go, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, that's a lot of mouths to feed. 850 false prophets. Prophets of Baal, prophets of the groves. God never intended to be worshipped in those places, and certainly not in Samaria. The prophets of the groves, 400, which do something. They eat at Jezebel's table. Now, you might think that that phrase is, is a very light thing, an unimportant fact. It is a very important fact. She is subsidizing the idolatry that is in Israel. And I find the same type of activity going on in America today. It is being subsidized by our government. That means that she promoted idolatry. It means that she enabled idolatry. She was causing idolatry. Even in our wonderful city here, I, I can give you a specific example uh, of a pastor, a famous pastor, who is doing that very thing. He is causing the problem, causing the split, and blaming others for it. And I'm telling you, God will judge. I told you I'd bring you down today. I gave you a fair warning. And so the number one mark of a Jezebel spirit is idolatry. Now most of us, I would presume practically all of us, would never take an image, uh, something man-made, and set it up as an object of our worship. Yet it does happen in our land today. Uh, that, that isn't where our idolatry might be. Perhaps ours is in money or, or fame or, or seeking after things of this world that we shouldn't seek after. But the reality is idolatry is in America today. It is rising in America today. God is being cast to the side and idolatry prevails more and more. Number two, the spirit of Jezebel, a Jezebel spirit are her murders. 1 Kings chapter 18, 4 and 13, I hope you're following in your study guide. In verse 4, Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. And if that doesn't make sense to you, cut off the prophets of the Lord, verse 13 will tell you exactly what it means. Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord. There is good and evil. There is righteousness and wickedness. And I'm here today to ask you, who's on the Lord's side? Because there will always be, because there's always been a division between who is on the Lord's side and who is not. Just ask old Moses. Who's on the Lord's side? This woman is so evil in the nation of the ten tribes of Israel that she slew the prophets of the Lord. Well, God's all-powerful, right? 
And, and God's all-knowing, right? Couldn't he have stopped it? Well, sure he could have. Yet, for whatever reason that you want to come up with, God has allowed the wicked Jezebel, Ahab, and the worshipers of Baal. He has allowed them to have their temporary time of authority and power. And I'm here as a preacher of this book, this Word of God, to tell you, don't be caught off by those things. Those things are temporary. They don't matter. What matters is the rest of the story, the end of it all, knowing that God will prevail. And in 1 Kings 18, my... Didn't he prevail? As Elijah stands there before that altar when the prophets of Baal could not fi bring fire down from heaven, Elijah stands there and says, where is... Or he, he calls down for, for, for God to reveal to them, rather, that he, he is the one true God. And God, well, God showed up. And so the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, 850 in total, they come to their end. But what goes around comes around. She slew the prophets of the Lord. And so God showed up and took care of the prophets of Baal. Then there is the murder of Naboth in 1 Kings chapter 21, 4 through 7 and 13 through 14. Here's old Naboth. He's got a vineyard. Ahab wants it. Naboth says no. And so we find Ahab being the wimp that he is. Verse 4 says he's heavy and displeased because the word of Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And so there's old Ahab. What's he doing? He's laying on his bed. <laughs> Turned away his face. He didn't eat no bread. You know, in my strict diet, uh, bread has kind of become a no-no. Boy, I sure enjoyed that bread I had last night. <laughs> cheese all over it. That's three cheese thing at Rico's. I did hold myself to two slices, but here's the king could have anything he wants to eat, and it'll be brought to him. And he's so whiny, he's there. I couldn't get the vineyard, and he's, he's a rich man, a king. And there he is laying on his bed, sulking. Years ago, Pastor Marshall LeCrone asked his mentor, Brother Shaw in Topeka, asked him, uh, what's the best advice you can give a young preacher? And uh, without a moment's hesitation, Brother Shaw said to Marshall LeCrone, gird thyself up and be a man. Amen. You know, America could use a few good men. It really is time to rise up and be what God intended us to be, not what the world thinks we should be, but rather be what God wants us to be. That is true. Real men and women of God. Oh, Ahab, he doesn't measure up in any fashion. So Jezebel comes to him in verse 5, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreel, and said unto him, Give me the vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. He answered, I will not give me, thee my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise, eat bread, and let thy heart be merry. I, Jezebel says, Jezebel says, I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreel. Huh. Wasn't hers to give. She's going to take it by force and by murder. Verse 13, the men of Belial. There's an interesting word in verse 13. Belial witnessed against Naboth. In the presence of the people saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Did Naboth do that? He did just the opposite of that. And that's exactly what's happening in America today. Being accused of things that we are not doing and lying about the things that the wicked are doing. Hmm. Where does it go from there? I will give you the vineyard of Naboth. So they witness against him. 
He blasphemed God and the king, and they carried him forth out of the city, stoned him with stones that he died. They sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. You know, this uh, thing about murder and death is quite alarming to me. I, uh, I went all through school never having to worry about somebody pulling a gun out and shooting up students in the school. Uh, it seemed to me like it all started in Colorado with those two gunmen. And at the time, my oldest son was still in high school. I asked him, I said, uh, hey, Philip, are, are there any guns in Olathe North? And he looked at me like I was stupid. He said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was back then. And, and so guess what old dad did? He prayed every day until the senior year was over. <laughs> God, keep him safe. Keep them safe. In the course of that time, two were killed on the football field at Olathe North in that time. Violence is consuming our land. And of course, murder is part of the spirit of Jezebel. There is, thirdly, Jezebel's vengeance. Something about hell hath no fury. Here is her vengeance against Elijah. Okay, so 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of the groves, 850 against one man of God, Elijah. And that, that's quite odds, right? 850 against one. I, I love the Living Bible translation of the story of 1 Kings at chapter 18. The King James just really softens it up. But if you read the Living Bible, they, they got a pretty good deal about that. When Elijah comes out there, the prophets of Baal have been calling for hours and hours and hours for the fire to come down, and nothing is happening. And, and according to the Living Bible, Elijah goes up to him, those hot, sweaty, nasty prophets of Baal, and he says, Is your God on the toilet? <laughs> making a mockery of their false worship, their wickedness. And of course, God sends down fire from heaven, consumes the altar, the sacrifice, licks up the water, everything about it, and Elijah has 850 false prophets put to death. But now, one woman... Now, I have lots of jokes here, but I'm not brave enough to tell them. <laughs> One woman threatens him in this fashion. For Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods, plural, small g, gods, do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now let me tell you something. Elijah is afraid of not 850 false prophets. He's afraid of one queen. Hmm. There's something about the human emotion that has to be looked at here. How we as human beings, even men and women of God, sometimes go through these spiritual highs and spiritual lows. And if you say you haven't experienced that, I, I really question that because I think we've all experienced it. I think Billy Graham experienced it in his lifetime. I, I think that each and every one of us have experienced things like that, the highs and the lows. How could you be more high than seeing what God did when he sent fire down from heaven and consumed that sacrifice? 850 false prophets are put to death. Man, you've got to be feeling the top of the world, and here comes the emotional factor. One queen threatens his life. By tomorrow, you're going to be dead. And what does he do? He runs away and sulks and hides and he tells us something very important, and I want you to catch this. Do not let your life be governed by your emotions. 
Come on, somebody shout. Don't let your life be governed by your emotions. Now, I'm an emotional man, make no mistake about it. But the reality is, that isn't the basis, the foundation, the strength of my life. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? And though there rose up wars against me, yet will I not be troubled. Hallelujah. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. Amen. And so if you can stand against 850 false prophets, surely you can stand boldly against the queen. Paul writes, and having done all to stand, stand. So he's afraid. She's got vengeance on her side and a threat. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? A threat. Have you ever been threatened? Yeah. Yeah. I think the devil comes to threaten you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And, and so he threatens and threatens and threatens. But he has no power over us. Neither did Jezebel because Elijah kept on living. Number four, her incitement of Ahab. 1 Kings 21, 25. But there was none like unto Ahab which did... Catch this. What did he do? He sold himself... Sold himself... To work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. How many of you know God is watching? Whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. I have some jokes there too, but I'm not brave enough to tell those either. She incites her husband, stirs him up. In the very beginning, he becomes an idolatrous, wicked king because of her influence. And now here she is again, inciting him, stirring him up. Number five. There is her whoredom and witchcraft. Came to pass when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother, Jezebel, and her witchcrafts are so many. Do you know that witchcraft is so celebrated today, it's beyond my imagination. I could have never imagined in, in this God-fearing nation that we would ever face the, the whoredoms and the witchcraft that we are facing. And I, I want to define clearly for you what witchcraft is. Witchcraft is when one human being tries to control, dominate another human being. That is the sin of witchcraft. My Bible says you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And if therefore the Son shall make you free, you shall be free, free indeed. Don't let any human being, not, even, not a preacher, not anyone, not a spouse, don't let anybody dominate and control your life. There's only one who should dominate and control your life and mine. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him have his way with thee. Witchcrafts abound. I, I marvel at all these fortune tellers that are on TV. And years ago it was Dionne Warwick, wasn't it? And, and of course her thing fell apart and went bankrupt. And, and our question constantly is, couldn't she see it coming? <laughs> these things never work out. And sometimes they come in very subtle and sneaky ways. And you better be on guard. Number six, there is her violent death. Elijah's pronounced that Jehu shall be king, anointed him with oil to be king. Jehu shall smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets. And the blood of all servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. God will have his day. I thought you'd shout amen to that, surely. Say it with me, God will have his day. The day of the Lord is coming, friends. God will have his day. I wish it was today. But fear not. God will have his way. And God will have his day. Probably sooner than any of us think. And so this violent death of Jezebel is prophesied in verse 10. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel. 
and there shall be none to bury her. That's quite a prophecy, isn't it? Not only that she's going to die, but number two, the dogs are going to eat her. Number three, there won't be anything left. That's a prophecy. And then the prophecy is fulfilled. Jehu comes to Jezreel. Jezebel heard of it. Verse 30, she painted her face, tired her head, and looked out a window. I don't know why the scripture includes that. She painted her face. I think it's probably for uh, preachers of 50 years ago that used to use that as a legalistic thing. But uh, nonetheless, she painted her face. There's a lot of face painting going on in our culture today. I've had enough of Pride Month. I, I pray for the Catholics. I'll tell you, they've been roundly abused in the month of June. It's blasphemous in every way. And isn't it interesting why they call it again Pride Month? I think Jesus gets Easter and Christmas, but they get a month. And, and, and they don't hide it. What is the original sin? Pride. Pride. And so what do we call it? This is Pride Month. And, and you would be hard-pressed to find a corporation, a business, that doesn't celebrate Pride Month. I find it detestable. Can't wait till it's over so we can get to Independence on the 4th of July. So there she is. She's painted her face. She looks out the window. And Jehu says in verse 33, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and he trode her underfoot. Verse 35. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than a skull and feet and palms of her hands. You can say, oh, that's, that's gross. It is the judgment of God that had been prophesied. And you take the words of God and you will know that God will do exactly what God says he will do. Yes. Armageddon is coming. Great tribulation will happen. And everything prophesied in the book of Revelation will come to pass. He prophesied the death of Jezebel, how it would happen, there would be nothing to bury, and here it is, fulfilled. Verse 36, wherefore they came again and told him, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. The carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. God knows how to deal with the wicked. And there comes her violent death. I have preached for many years these two truths, and they are more and more true today than they've ever been in the past when we preached it. There is sexual perversion, and there is violence consuming this nation. And you know it's true. I wish I could tell you that they're going to find some social answer to it, but they are not. There's only one answer for it. Carl sang about it earlier. Jesus is the answer for the world today. There is only one answer, only one solution, but if they reject him, of course, these things continue in their fashion. And Jezebel wasn't the last wicked one in Israel, to be sure. Finally, we move from the book of First and Second Kings to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Her seductions. Notice the point is plural. Her seductions. Revelation 2 verses 20 is about the church of Thyatira, one of the seven churches of Asia. And he says to the church of Thyatira, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Say, because. because. God bless all five of you. I have a few things against thee. Because. That's better. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself. That's important. She calls herself a prophetess. 
She wasn't called by God or the gods that don't even exist. She calls herself a prophetess. What is she doing? As far back as First and Second Kings, but now fast forward to the book of Revelation to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I, Jesus says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. What's the only answer for that situation? Except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death. Her seductions have a price to be paid. This is a Sunday night sermon that won't happen because you're going to have fried chicken. <laughs> the land, America, from sea to shining sea, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. The land is spewing out its inhabitants while we sit here in this comfortable church. Listen, we've always had immigration. Wakefield, sounds like I came from England and Ireland. Two-thirds British and one-third Irish. I just found out I was one-third Irish a couple of years ago. Stevens gave me one of those tests, you know, and I spit into it and found out I was one-third Irish. I had to go out and buy two green shirts. <laughs> and a green tie. Who knew I was one-third Irish? I feel so included now. <laughs> We've always had immigration. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. This wretched refuse from our... We've always had it. It's right. It's in the heart of America. It is the basis on which this great nation has been formed. And we are pro-immigration. Great. Being an immigrant, I'm thankful for that. I went to uh, Ellis Island to find my family history of immigration. There's only one Wakefield on the books. But there's one. But the land today is vomiting out her inhabitants. It's not the first time it's happened in North America. The long history of these things, over centuries of time. But you watch and you'll see that it's true. The warning is given in the law book of Leviticus, Moreover thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife, to defile thyself with her. That's adultery, and God says it is grotesque sin. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, having your children killed in the worship of a false god. Neither thou sh shalt thou profane the name of thy god. Oh, that happens constantly. You can't, you can't rent a movie without them profaning the name of God. He says, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. Homosexuality, it is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. You can say the word abomination. And you can say the word confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled which God says, which I, God, cast out before you. What did God do? God cast them out. I have 22 verses in my library, 22 verses that speak of God removing the inhabitants of the land. He always has, and he always will. And he's doing it right now in the United States of America. Hmm. I thought you'd agree with me, but evidently not. Which I have cast out. And the land is defiled. 
Therefore I do not visit, it, visit the iniquity thereof upon it. The land itself, what? King James vomiteth out her inhabitants. In another place, the blood of violence cries out from the ground. And all of these things are happening in our very day. So in conclusion, I ask you this very important question. Is the Jezebel spirit in America today? Is there idolatry? Is there murder? Is there vengeance? Is there incitement? Is there whoredom? Is there witchcraft? Is there violence? Is there death? Is there seduction? All of these things exist. So what should we do? If my people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. We should pray. I mentioned the verse earlier, having done all to stand. Stand. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. So run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. Hallelujah. What did our Lord tell us to do? He said, occupy. Occupy till I come. Man, I enjoyed the verses on when the battle's over. We haven't done, we do the course, but we haven't done the verses. It's a call to be the people of God that we should be. You, you know, we're supposed to be the light of, of this world and the salt of this earth. To be the people that God intends us to be. If you have time, take a look at the last verse in the book of Revelation, chapter 18. It speaks of Babylon, but it really refers in type to Jezebel. Nothing good comes from wickedness. And everything good comes from righteousness. Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So here's the deal. Israel and the United States of America are the two greatest nations that have ever been on the face of the earth. Oh, we're afraid of the Russians. Well, they're not doing very well today, are they? We've always been afraid of the Russians. They got more nukes than we got. If the Lord is on your side, you don't have to worry about any nation, any leader, any threat. And here I live, born the greatest year you could ever be born. I say it all the time. You could not pick a year in the history of the United States to be born better than the year 1959 when Cadillacs had fins. <laughs> Those babies were full-size cars. You go rent a car today, say, I want a full-size car. I want a 1959 Eldorado Cadillac. Good luck. Why would a godly nation so blessed as ours want to trade in the blessing and favor of God for violence and depravity and perversion? Church, it's time to repent and it's not the wicked that need to do it. My people, called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. God, deliver us from a Jezebel spirit. My foes.